Welcome to Blackriot Gaming. Today, we'll be looking at the Salamanders in the next video in our How to Build a Legion series. We will cover off on four main areas. Firstly, how the box set supports the building of a Salamander's army. Secondly, how the Legion's special rules can be best taken advantage of on the table. Thirdly, how rights of war impact unit selection. And lastly, whether any Legion characters, Warlord traits, or the Legion advanced reaction change the way you might build and play your army. Hopefully, this is useful not only to those interested in salamanders, but for all Legion players, giving them an understanding of the concepts behind army building in Horus Heresy and an idea of what each Legion can bring to the table. I hope you enjoy. Just a quick note before we get into it, a subscribe and a like really helps us reach a bigger audience, so if you enjoy the video, please hit those buttons down below. Now, salamanders are a really interesting army that have a few competing opportunities, making them a bit of a challenge to build and still see success on the table. You at once want to unleash the, uh, the dragon-themed flame on your enemies, but delivering that short-ranged firepower can be a bit tricky when selecting the most flame-filled right of war. Let's get into it. First up is the box set. The box set is absolutely suitable for a Salamander's army, though it really depends on how you feel about Mark VI's army. Uh, armor, I should say. Uh, personally, I think Mark III and Mark IV armor types suit the Salamanders a bit better, uh, but it just comes down to personal preferences. I've seen some Horus Heresy veterans getting into Mark VI for Salamanders, so you can absolutely do it if that's what you're into. If you're happy to go the bulk Mark VI for your flame-loving legion, then you do you. Tactical squads, tactical support squads, and heavy support squads are all going to have a place in a Salamander's army. Just because you can, I'd lean towards the Melter, Flamer, Plasma, and Volkite weapons for your sports squads, which are all the fun ones anyway, and it keeps the red, hot Salamanders theme going strong. However, there's certainly nothing wrong with kitting out a squad with missile launchers if you need it on the table. Salamanders love a big unit of Terminators, and Cataphracti suit them well. My advice is this. If you're planning on taking Vulcan, the Salamander's Primarch, then your basic Cataphracti boys will get the job done nicely as a unit to accompany him and unleash the pain. If you're not planning on taking Vulcan, I'd probably rather have a unit of Fire Drake Terminators instead. Now this may seem counterintuitive and it may not suit the narrative, but for me it all comes down to stubborn and the damage output. Vulcan gives all of your infantry stubborn. Fire Drakes have it naturally and did no doubt paying for it in their points. Same same, if you've got Vulcan in the unit, you don't really need the extra killing power that the Fire Drakes, or the extra survivability really, that the Fire Drakes are paying for and bringing to the unit. Uh, Vulcan is going to give it to those Cataphracti. But you know what? Fire Drakes also look really cool, so definitely something to think about. Now you could always get creative and, and do some conversion work and use your kit-bashed Cataphracti as either unit, depending on how you're feeling on the day. Salamanders are going to need transports, quite a few of them, and a Spartan is a great starting place. Not much more needs to be said at this point, uh, but a Spartan to deliver your Cataphracti or Fire Drakes and Vulcan if you bring him along is almost a must. Dreadnoughts. Now, Salamanders love Dreadnoughts for reasons I will get into in the next section. Uh, pretty much chuck a big old melter on this bad boy for added flavor and get burning and punching your enemy. When it comes to Praetors, Salamanders don't actually have a lot of good options for, uh, for either their Praetors or the Centurions. Forgeworld gave up on them a long time ago from a, from a miniatures perspective, and nothing in 40k translates particularly well. The generic characters from Forgeworld also don't scream Salamanders to me, so I'd maybe grab a head from the Salamanders upgrade set, either the current Forgeworld one, or, or wait until the new second ed ones come out, uh, and stick it on one of these Praetors for, to give it a little bit of flavour. Salamanders uh, do Love shields and hammers uh, if you're keen to get real creative. So using bits from a Fire Drake miniature on one of the box set Praetors could definitely work. Same, same. Uh, there's some 40k Salamander miniatures out there. Not many, but a few. And some of the older ones may fit the scale a bit better. So converting one of them up or, or mixing them in with, with some of your Praetors that you're getting in the box set may be the way to go if, uh, if you're into converting. Now with that covered, let's have a chat about the Salamander's special rules. That special rule is called Blood of Fire, and it reads, When rolling to wound against a model with this special rule for any attack inflicted by a flame, melter, plasma, or volkite weapon or effect, reduce the result of that roll to wound by minus one. This does not affect the strength of the attack, only the result of the roll to wound. In addition, all models with this special rule that have more than one wound or hull point 
Game that ill will not die. Six plus special rule. Instantly, I want to be leaning towards dreadnoughts and elite units of infantry for this for this uh, for this special rule. But let's dig a bit deeper. It's really important to have a look at the Salamander's Dragon Breath weapons and their psychic discipline before we can have a good analysis of their rules. So their Dragon Breath weapons are essentially all of their flamers, whether it be flame pistols, flamers, heavy flamers, or flame cannons, um, if, that, if that's a thing, uh, essentially get upgraded. Uh, same, same, they can give these weapons to a bunch of units that couldn't normally have it. Mostly tanks is what I'm talking about there, but the idea is they each get a extra pip of strength. So for instance, a, a regular flamer that you'd have on a tactical support Marine goes up to strength five and AP four. So I'm pretty sure the AP improves there as well. Uh, all still assault, that's fine, uh, at least for the, the heavy flamer and the flamer, and it gets the rule dragon's breath. Now this is what we care about here. So this is all flame weapons that the salamanders have get this dragon's breath rule. And this reads, when attacking using the wall of death special rule, which is all about shooting, uh, that's overwatch, right? So when you're shooting flamers at units that are charging you, a weapon with this special rule inflicts D6 hits instead of D3. So this means if you have a full squad of 10 tactical support Marines with flamers, when a unit's charging into them, they're going to be doing 10 times D6 hits which is just insane. I think I did the averages in the, the Salamanders um, teaser video that I did, and it came out to something like eight wounds or eight killed Marines in a, in a regular squad as they're charging on in. It's absolutely nuts. Super powerful. So that's the Dragon's Breath weapon. So keep that in mind as I, as I chat later on about what the army builds are looking like. And I just wanted to touch on the, the psychic discipline of the Salamanders as well. So it's called Fury of the Salamander, and it's got a, a psychic power and a, a psychic weapon as well. I'm just going to quickly read out the psychic power so we can talk about that later as well so the psychic power reads at the start of their own player's turn the controlling player of a psyker with this power may choose to make a psychic check if the check is successful then all enemy models within 18 of the psyker treat all open terrain as difficult terrain and all difficult terrain as both difficult and dangerous until the start of the psyker's controlling player's next player turn Interesting. Uh, however, the Psyker may not move, make shooting attacks, or charge in that turn, which is actually pretty pretty crippling, but that's that's fine. Uh, if the check has failed, the Psyker suffers a parallel warp, but may otherwise act normally. So 18-inch bubble of difficult and or dangerous terrain for the enemy. That's really big. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little later. It comes into their defensiveness. So there's some, some super spicy stuff there in regards to what the Salamander is getting for their special rules. That psychic power and that intense flame of action has me leaning towards a very defensive army. The one that wants to get right up in your opponent's face and dare them to charge, which is quite unique as defensive armies go. It's kind of cool. It plays really nicely towards a force that can own the board, hold objecti objectives, and isn't scared of getting charged, which is something other more shooting-based legions really struggle with. Units that can take these flamers are first on my list. A tactical support squad and a heavy support squad, both with flame weapons, are a great start. Though the extra poop of strength from the heavy version probably isn't worth the extra points. Heavy support slot or heavy subtype that come with it. So maybe just two tactical support squads. Fill up those troops, right? I'd want at least one unit of 10 pyro class. Now the pyro class are the salamanders, one of their special units. They are absolutely insane. Uh -huh. They can switch their flamey goodness between either anti-infantry or anti-vehicle using them either as a, I think, strength six flamer, which is, which is nuts, or as a, a strength eight melter gun, essentially. Uh, now they're not exactly cheap in points. I think they're about 30 points, but when compared to a Legion tactical support squad kitted out with melter guns, which are only slightly cheaper, they look absolutely amazing. We're talking, I think for a unit of five, we're talking like 15 points difference between a unit of Pyroclast and a unit of Legion Tactical Support Squad Marines, five of them with melter guns. And for that 15 points, you know, you're getting an extra wound, you're getting two plus save, you're getting extra leadership, you're getting extra attacks, you're getting better weapons, uh, you've got the flexibility. It, you just, you can't compare them. In fact, the more I read about these guys, the more I want to include them in my Alpha Legion army, actually. Now, I could go on, I could go on, but I won't. Um, let's just say the models also are lizardy themed perfection. So get Pyroclast in there, no matter what you're doing with Salamanders, you want a unit of 10, maybe more, maybe more units with, uh, with these guys. So as we're going short range firepower with those Pyroclast, as I said, and with those tactical support squads with flamers, we're going to need a robust delivery mechanism. 
If you're picking a Salamander's Rite of War, this generally leaves you with Rhinos and Land Raiders. I'm pretty worried about how long Rhinos are going to survive on the battlefields of the 31st Millennium, so Land Raiders of various kinds may be the best way to go for each of these units that wants to get up the table and set things on fire, or at least your more expensive units. I'd be putting them in Land Raiders for some added protection and making your opponent choose between shooting at Land Raiders uh, or shooting at Rhinos with weaker squads in them. So if you've got the cash and you kind of hate yourself from a from a hobby perspective, or if GW blesses us with a plastic version, fingers crossed, uh, a couple of Storm Eagles would be a really interesting choice for a Salamander's army. I'd personally be tempted to leave the Salamander's Rights of War at home and go with a Drop Pod Assault uh, and Drop Pod all that short range firepower straight into the enemy lines. But the Drop Pod Right of War is very restrictive of what units you can and can't take uh, and really suffers in certain missions as well. So it's a bit of a gamble. If you have to choose between tanks and dreadnoughts, uh, I'd go the dreadnoughts. So we've already, we've decided in our Salamander's army, we need, we need flamers, we need transports, they're musts. In regards to more fire support and other sporting units, I'm going to go the dreadnoughts here as they get the benefit of the minus one to wound from the Salamander special rule, which is so nice on an already high toughness unit. It also gives you some extra punch in combat once your lines inevitably get charged. And if any of the enemy forces actually make it through your dragon's breath, wall of death. Now this is going to be yet another infantry heavy army with that six plus, it will not die for vehicles, just not being a big enough selling point when your dreadnoughts and elite two win infantry get it as well. Remember those pyro class? Yeah, they've got it will not die, but I'm pretty sure they've got it on a five plus, so even better. Uh, you know who also gets the It Will Not Die bonus and who also loves minus one to wound on a bunch of powerful weapons? Yep, jet bikes and land speeders. Now, unfortunately, there's just not much room for these in either of the Salamander's Rites of War nor a Drop Pot Assault. Uh, I guess you can put them in there, but then they're going in reserve. If you're not running any of these Rites of War, though, I'd seriously consider these units, which are a whole lot tougher when they're being run as Salamanders. For this reason... And the reasons I've already talked about, that it will not die, minus one to wound, Salamanders love Terminators. Both generic lads and their own fire, drunk, fire drakes, which I've already mentioned. You're going to be taking a bunch and putting them in a Spartan to support your advance. Aim them at the units in your opponent's army that aren't afraid of running into bulk flamers. Particular things like uh, term enemy Terminators with a 2 plus save or, or high toughness units. Dreadnoughts, for instance, cannot for your flamers when running into assault. So get them tangled up with your own Terminators first. So that's the uh, the generic way that I would build a Salamander's army, just looking at their rules. Let's now take a look at the Salamander Rites of War. So they have two, and they're divided into pre and post Isfan 5 styles of warfare. Our first Rite of War, the Covenant of Fire, is all about that flamer action, and I think it will be the more popular option. If maybe not the most interesting. It reads. All right, right of war, covenant of fire, the effects. So the power class squads and legion tactical support squads that include any models with dragon's breath flamers may be taken as troop choices in a detachment using this right of war and gain the line unit subtype. Big one there. Legion predators squadrons composed entirely of models with only dragon's breath cannon and dragon's breath heavy flamers as weapons may be chosen as non-compulsory troop choices in a detachment using this right of war. Limitations. Detachments using this right of war may not make deep strike assaults. Brutal. Uh, but, however, they may still be assigned to a subterranean assault or flanking assault. Okay. A detachment using this right of war may not include destroy squads or Moritat. Fine. And a detachment using this right of war must include a Legion Centurion, Legion Cataphracti Centurion, or Legion Tartarus Centurion with the Legion Champion console upgrade. So what are the pros here? Remember how I was saying the power class look really, really good? Uh, just a reminder, two wounds, two plus save, better leadership. It will not die five plus. I could keep going. Now they're troops. They're troops in this right of war. And more importantly, and you don't see that that often with the rights of war, they gain the line unit subtype, which is also important for objective capturing. This is very significant. Super into it. Uh, a unit just full of power class is a really tasty option. Uh, Predator Squadrons, kitted out with flame weapons, and being able to take them as troop choices, it's a bit of fun, and it's good for a laugh, but with so many Terminators kicking around that we're about to see, uh, and their associated power fists, I'm just not sure I want to be running hundreds of points worth of tanks into my enemy lines, because you're going to have to get close from those flamer weapons. 
and I'm just not into it. I think those die super quickly. So those are the pros. Mostly it's about those para class being troops. Now the cons, uh, I'll get the least two impactful ones out of the way first. You need to include a Legion champion console and you can't bring destroyer themed units or characters. Eh, fine, that's fine. Legion champion, he chops stuff up good. So it's not overly exciting, but close combat's a thing. So you're not gonna lose sleep about having to bring one. Uh, not being able to take destroyers or a Moritat, not that impactful, uh, mostly because of the big limitation on deep striking, which is what you you want your jump pack uh, and Moritat, your jump pack destroyers, I should say. They've got a special name, can't remember it right now. Uh, and your Moritat getting in there, they wanna be deep striking. So seeing as you can't deep strike, you don't wanna take them anyway. Now I think deep, the biggest the biggest limitation here is that you can't deep strike. And I think deep striking is gonna be a huge part of second edition. And at least unless it gets balanced pretty soon, pretty powerful. Most armies are going to want something coming in by deep strike. And certainly it would be my preference for most close combat units, Legion pending, uh, to come in by deep strike as well. And, and short range firepower also wants to be coming down in drop pods. Oh, so it's, look, it's tough. It's a tough ride of war. So. What does this mean for how you're building your army if you're taking this right of war? So you're really already doing the things that we've discussed and the things that you wanna be doing with salamanders, but letting you capture objectives while doing it, which is really nice. So your army will look like something, it, it'll, look, it'll include a couple of pyroclasts at least uh, in either land raiders or rhinos. It's gonna include a couple of units of tactical support squads in land raiders or rhinos. I probably wouldn't want to take more than two, maybe at a max three land raiders in an army. So you're gonna want a couple of rhinos for those weaker squads, that being your tactical support squads. They're gonna have to, they're gonna have to get in there. Uh, I want to include a nice big beefy unit of Terminators, Fire Drakes or Cataphracti, I'm easy, and probably Vulcan as well and chuck them all in a Spartan uh, and just have a great time with them and ram them straight into my opponent's army as I jump out with flamers at the same time. Now, why take Vulcan? It's because of all that stubborn, that stubborn that he gives to all of your infantry that we mentioned before and that's super nice. Though arguably, maybe not necessary once the enemies had to charge past that wall of death. So maybe you can save points uh, and just go with the, the Legion Praetor, which you have to run because they've got the uh, the Masters of Legion special rule that you need to take a right of war. So you want to include a couple of Dreadnoughts if you can, in this, if you can afford it in this right of war. They're pretty fast with movement eight. So they're getting up the table while still putting down some pretty good firepower to support your army. Now this army does need to get up the table to actually have an impact with all of that close range firepower. So having some long range shooting to provide cover while your transports surge forward would be pretty handy and also to sit back and hold some home objectives. But this army is already so points heavy that you may not get the opportunity. You may not be able to afford it. But if you did, I'd go missile launchers or, or las cannons, most efficiently subdue the enemy's own anti-firepower, anti-armor firepower, I should say, whether it's infantry or, or vehicle-based. So get some get some heavy weapons in there if you can uh, if you can afford it on the points and what kind of points you're playing at. So look, that's the Covenant of Fire, Rite of War. It's classic Salamander's action, all of the flames, Terminators involved. Next up is their other Rite of War, and it's called the Awakening Fire. And it starts to get into this really dark post Isvan V narrative as the sons of Vulcan turn to the Promethean cult and forbidden faith to uh, overcome their grief. Now this, it just gets me interested. I'm super into it. So what are the pro? Uh, let's, let's read it out. So the effects, all models with both the infantry unit type and the Legion Legiones, a start as salamanders, in a unit selected in part of a detachment using this right of war may be given fear one special rule for 20 points per unit. Next up, all models with both the infantry unit subtype and the Salamander special rule in a detachment, blah, blah, blah. Ignore all modifiers to their leadership when making pinning tests. Next up, all models in this detachment uh, and our psychers may choose to have the fury of the Salamander discipline instead of any other discipline. And a detachment using this right of war gains a single additional non-compulsory HQ choice, which may only be used to select a Legion Centurion with the Chaplain console upgrade. He's the one, he's the one spurting all that faith nonsense. Good stuff. All right, limitations. Uh, let's see, you can only have, I'll just, I'll just paraphrase. You can only have one cavalry unit type and you can't include anything with a jump pack, brutal. And a detachment using this right of war must include a Chaplain console upgrade. And lastly, it can't have Vulcan in it. He is kind of dead, but also kind of not dead, but we won't go into that. So what are the pros? Fear, this is this this right of war, all about fear, giving fear to all of your infantry units, going to be really powerful in second edition as a special rule. It's a bubble, it's a bubble of negative leadership. 
essentially. Now with Marine leadership being lower across the board, rerolls harder to come by and pinning being super important to shut down reactions, a minus one to leadership is not insignificant. However, I'm a little disappointed and here's a bit of a con, you have to pay 20 points per unit to get it. If you give that to just, you know, four or five of your infantry units, that's taken up a big chunk of points for something that may come into effect, but also may not. So I'm pretty disappointed. You have to pay points for it. Seems unnecessary, but it is what it is. Now, ignoring all modifiers to leadership sounds good until you realize it's only for pinning. So that second bit of the right of war, also not that exciting. Uh, now, this right of war is how you can access Fury of the Salamandic Psychic Power Discipline. So this I'm excited about. It's got that super tasty power that applies that 18 inch bubble that I read out before of difficult and dangerous terrain to the enemy. Now with the caveat that I obviously have not yet seen it in action, I'm still gonna go and say that this psychic power is absolutely going to frustrate assault based armies. Unfortunately, it's also going to be almost useless against shooting armies. So keep that in mind. I thought there's good things in here, but they all have a bit of a butt attached to them. Uh, the next piece, you get a non-compulsory HQ slot. Sure, for a chaplain, great. So what are the cons? Now, first up, you have to take a chaplain, but I actually see this is kind of cool. Chaplains, chaplains seem really good. So having an excuse to take one for a nice fluffy reason is, is really nice. Not much of a con at all. Sign me up, I'm into it, especially with that free slot. Better than a boring old Legion champion that, uh, that the Covenant of Fire has to take. So that's that. Now, only one cavalry unit uh, talks to the point I made earlier in the video where salamanders just don't get to enjoy jet bikes and land speeders, which is a shame from a rules point of view because they're pretty tough in this army. But it makes sense narratively as the stoic salamanders, they're just not into that sort of fast paced nonsense. Same, same, no units with jump pack, not even one. Real shame because assault squads that cause fear and automatic pinning checks when deep striking, mmm, tasty stuff. But look, narratively, salamanders aren't into it. If that's what you're about, you're going to have to look at night lords, I believe. But they're not, they're not coming up for a while. Lastly, uh, you can't take Vulcan. Uh, the narrative strikes again, I get it. Bit of a shame, because Primarchs are fun, but if you want this right of war, Vulcan has, has been taken out and, and is hanging out with uh, Kurz, I wanna say. Is that who he's hanging out with? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty sure he's getting tortured. He's busy. He's busy getting tortured right now. He can't join your Awakening Fire army. So what are the impacts here? So many limitations and a lack of flashy rules will make this a rather unpopular right of war, I expect. Fear is a really nice rule, but having to pay 20 points for it is not that nice. And not being able to take it on a bunch of deep striking units that I usually want to take in this army is kind of frustrating. The narrative is really cool here, but I think they've let it cripple the army building potential. If I were to build this right of war, uh, that army goes really close combat heavy, supported by a significant artillery force to pin the enemy as I charge in. Pinning, super important. Uh, you Mainly, mainly because it's taking advantage of that fear bubble that you're handing out with your infantry that are about to charge in, seeing as we can't get it from deep striking. Now I'm predominantly picking terminators for those close combat units where I can and where I've got the four sword slots as they can take advantage of the salamanders that will not die special rule and other close combat options such as the spoilers depart the narrative and also can't, right? One wound infantry, not for me, not for salamanders. You want those two wounds so you get those chances for that it will not die throughout the game, which are gonna stack up. Now, once again, land raiders are gonna be your best friend. So you have protection getting up the table and can assault on the turn that you disembark. Not all vehicles are, of course, assault vehicles in Horus Heresy. So those land raiders that are assault vehicles, and not all are, it should be noted, are the ones you're going to want to take. Dreadnoughts do the same job they always do, so keep them in mind as ever. They punch stuff, they shoot stuff, they're tough in this army, so they're great. For my compulsory troops choices, a couple of meaty tactical squads to hold objectives and, and pick off those screening units will really come in handy. Taking a unit of 15 or 20 will make them unpleasant to shift, either by shooting or assault. So you don't have to worry about your midfield while you crash forward to hit things with hammers and power fists. You've got your chaplain, uh, but you're going to need to take a Praetor uh, as well. So a defensive Praetor is probably the way I wanna go here to be a warlord uh, and chuck it in with those unit of, unit of terminators to make sure that enemy characters striking first aren't going to kill a bunch of them before they get to get in there with their power fists. So there you have it. Those are the two Salamander Rites of Wars, one for flaming, one for punching. That's how I'd be building them out. 
Both are pretty restrictive in their builds and potentially not actually the way I want to run a Salamander's army, but both are fun and will have their uses. A reminder to check out the core rights of war to see if they're more suited to the army you want to build. And if you want to include a bunch more units, that's probably the way and, and more varied units, including jet bikes and, and, and land speeders, which our salamanders are kind of cool. That's probably the way you want to go. Core rights of war, check them out. Now, unfortunately, there's nothing overly impactful from a warlord's characters or advanced reaction perspective for the salamanders. Though it should be noted that their advanced reaction further pushes that short ranged defensive build I discussed earlier, giving a number of close combat theme benefits to a unit being charged. Now, what I really want to see in the future is some Black Shield rules that have flavorful characters for the Salamanders and, and Iron Hands and Raven Guard, sure, but that's not what we're talking about here. I want to see some unique army builds for those Black Shields that I can get really excited about for my Salamanders. We'll just have to wait and see. So that brings us to the end of our Legion build for Salamanders for today. Thank you so much for watching. Let us know in the comments how you are planning to build your Salamanders army. Are you going to go with those pretty restrictive Legion Rites of War, or are you going to go in another direction and get more varied with the units that you include in your green, black, and flame-themed army? Thank you so much for watching. Importantly, make sure to keep rolling those dice and getting hyped for heresy.